Hey everyone, Adam here. Hillary and I have been working on some new episodes for the Train Right podcast. In the meantime, we've been busy doing our day to day jobs of coaching. And uh, we've been on some other podcasts as well. One podcast in particular that I've been on is the Coachcast, hosted by Dirk Friel. If you haven't listened to it, I suggest going over and giving that a listen as well. It's it's filled with uh, great athletes, coaches, and physiologists, much much like the Train Right podcast, to equip the endurance athlete with everything they need to know about uh, training, racing, and taking care of themselves. He reached out to myself and one of my athletes, Allison Tetrick, who's been a longtime CTS athlete, to do an interview and talk about uh, doing what we do. And uh, it was a fun interview. So uh, here at Train Right Podcast, we wanted to share that with you all. And a lot of it is we had to talk about how we had to pivot during this uh, pandemic. And for those of you who don't know Allison's story, she she showcases that very colorfully as she normally does. And overall, I think that there are some great takeaways that you can get from this episode and apply to your uh, training right now. So without further ado, uh, thank you, Dirk Friel, for letting us repurpose this here on the Train Right Podcast. Hi, I'm Dirk Friel, co-founder of Training Peaks, and you're listening to the Training Peaks Coachcast. I'll be sitting down with expert endurance coaches and amazing athletes, each with special stories to tell. At its heart, Training Peaks is about helping you create the best journey possible towards your endurance goals. We hope these stories inspire you to get out there, train with purpose, and never be afraid to sign up for that next big challenge. Today, I'm happy to interview coach Adam Pulford and one of his professional athletes, Allison Tetrick, to get the inside scoop on what makes their relationship so successful. Adam has been coaching for 15 years and has a bachelor's of science degree in exercise physiology and has a ton of experience managing both road and mountain bike teams. Allison was a professional road racer and won a bronze medal at the 2014 World Championships in the team time trial. She then changed her focus to gravel racing and became the queen of gravel, by setting the woman's course record at the 200 mile long Dirty Kanza. She is also a two time gravel world champion, having won the world in 2017 and 2018. Okay, well, on today's show, we have Uber, gravel, uh, everything else cycling related athlete Allison Tetrick and her coach, CTS coach, Adam Pulford. Thank you guys for joining me today. Thanks for having us. We're excited. Yeah, thanks, Dirk. Yeah, you know, um, I'd love to know how you guys got to this this time. You're both, you know, top of your class in your professions. Um, Allison, you have a very diverse background, even before cycling. So I'd love, you know, a little background in terms of how you got to cycling and what kind of led you to to the gravel. Yeah, so I grew up on a cattle ranch in Northern California um, and didn't really play sports until high school picked up tennis and I ended up playing NCAA tennis at Evelyn Christian University um, and was an All-American Scholar athlete there. Um, Super fun, just graduated and still was really competitive. Tennis was pretty frustrating um, because unlike endurance sports, the more you train at tennis, like I actually didn't get any better. Um, (laughs) But doing something like running, the more you ran, you know, the faster you get each week. And so I had a little competitive edge and I was working in chemistry research and drug discovery at Amgen in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and just ran up and down the Charles. And I thought I was pretty fast. And then, um, turns out you can't run 10 miles every day for a year. Um, (laughs) I'm a little obsessive compulsive. (laughs) And so I needed to do some cross training and my grandfather, uh, raced bikes and well into his eighties. He didn't find the sport until after the age of 50, but he, was like a 17 time masters national champion. And he wow. won the 80 plus, you know, and I got to go and cheer him on, but he used to tell me, Oh, you should take up cycling. You could go to the Olympics alley, you know, try this sport. And I thought it was super dorky. I'm like, you wear tight clothes, you look funny. Um, it just <laughs> looks complicated. And then when I needed to, uh, find some cross training, I t- picked up a triathlon. So I bought a bike, okay. 
drove to Colorado to surprise my grandfather that I bought a bike, didn't know how to clip in. And, you know, he takes me at the, to a bike race. And, you know, from there, it was just history. Um, I got invited to the Olympic Training Center, town ID camp. Um, and by the first three months after I learned how to clip into a bike, I think I was racing in Europe for the USA national team. Wow. And my grandfather got to follow that career um, as I raced all over the world for about nine years. Um, and I just love the sport. I think endurance sports in general are super exciting. Um, and then after racing for so long, I was finding that I, and then Adam met me through this too, but just, I wasn't that inspired about the races I was attending and something that sounded new and adventurous was the dirty Kanza. So that was my first gravel race. Um, and I was still racing on an UCI world tour team at the time. And I entered dirty Kanza, never raced gravel, never had ridden over 120 miles. And set the record and rode 206 miles and one. And then from there, I was like, oh, these are my people. So yeah, soup. Hey, and along the way, wildflower, I mean, you won wildflower tri- I mean, You didn't even mention triathlon in there. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I did, I did win the wildflower triathlon. <laughs> oh, d- d- been there, done that. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I, that one actually was really fun. Um, I'm not a super fast runner, but I'm more, I'm not like particularly small individual. So like if it's a really fast leg speed thing, but that, that course was good for the run because it's a trail run and it's kind of power course. And I love that course and the, and the cycling, the bike portion as well is just really like power. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Awesome. Adam, your turn. Tell us a little about, about your, uh, history and why coaching. I grew up in Northern Minnesota, kind of the team sport model. Uh, but even before that, I was kind of, I was the, I was the fat kid on the, on the school bus that people were making fun of. And, and my brother was very athletic and he was the one that kind of, you know, inspired me or goaded me into, Hey man, like if you got all these big aspirations of doing things like in football, I think at the time it was, um, you got to change, you got to change your habits. And I remember that it's like fifth grade or something, you know, and, and I, started to, uh, I started to explore that. I started to run. I started to lift weights and, uh, just threw myself into training. I, I just started reading everything that I could about it. And meanwhile, um, kind of found my athletic self and, um, kind of, you know, again, throughout high school is all team sports. I wrestled, I wrestled through college and that's where I had a really unique experience with coaching. I was a chemistry major at the time. And I didn't know where I was going with that. I was, I was this jock <laughs> in the, in the uh, chem labs, breaking everything's blowing stuff up and titrating stuff from one Petri dish to the next. And I was like, what am I going to do with this? So I talked to my wrestling coach and he said, uh, talk to Carl Foster. He's the exercise phys professor and he was president of the ACSM at the time. Yeah. He go, yeah, he was Eric Hyden's speed skating coach. And uh, I was like, oh, that's gotta be cool. So and because he knew I loved to run and I was getting into bikes at the time. And so I sat in on one of his classes and I was just captivated. I was, I was like sold because it had the science, but it had the athletic part. So I switched my major, everything carried over really well. And so I was able to work with Dennis Klein, the strength coach, uh, develop different st- training strategies for the Olympics, which is super fun. I was holding a clipboard and, you know, moving one weight to the other, but, it, you know, I was, I was involved. Uh, yeah. did an undergrad research project, uh, studying the effects of Olympic style weight training, plyometrics and endurance athletes, and got an internship at CTS after that turned into a job 15 years later, here we are talking on uh, virtual podcasting about coaching and training. Yeah, super cool. Thank you so much. So Allison, have you always had a cycling coach? I mean, you had tennis coaches, uh, when you got into endurance, all on your own? Was it your grandfather? Tell us something about, you know, expert instruction here. Yeah. So, um, I think this is how we met Dirk, but I am a kind of a data junkie. I'm a little dorky. Yeah. I've obviously a biochemistry background, um, and master's in clinical psychology. And I just like numbers. And when I bought my first bike, I didn't know how to clip in. I didn't have any cycling clothes, but I needed a power meter. So, oh my Lord. uh-huh. Cause that's uh-huh. what, you know, triathletes need. Yeah. And, um, initially, um, I moved to the Bay area because I wanted, oh, I needed another, I had another job offer for, um, chemistry research and 
I sat in that office with my little lab coat with my name embroidered on it, looking outside at everyone running, riding bikes on the path in South San Francisco. And I thought, I don't want to have to work to play. I want to play at my work. So I pulled out that magazine, competitor magazine or whatever, the free magazine, get your running shop or something. And in the back, there was this ad for Endurance Performance Training Center. And um, I like call them up. I'm like, I want to work for you. They're like, you nice. can work at the front desk for 15 bucks an hour. I was like, sold. <laughs> my parents were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, so my first thing, like, I didn't have Charlie Livermore. He actually works with the BMC team, which is now CCC, oh, yeah. something like that. Um, he's yeah. also a CTS coach. But at the time, yeah. he was at Endurance. And he just like, Al, you, you got to learn how to ride a bike. You can't keep falling over. Um, you know, and so he actually said, you also have to learn how to pedal over 70 RPMs, you know, so he was kind of my first coach, just, just in like a mentoring, helping me learn how to ride a bike. Yeah. And that was fantastic. And we're dear friends to this day. And then I was doing podium presentations at the tour of Colorado uh, for the men's race. And I, then I got bored because I realized you have to drive from the start to the finish. And it takes just as long as to ride your bike from the start to the finish because transfers and so I thought, well, I'm just going to ride from the start to the finish and then do the podium. And then I get to ride my bike all day and still do my little thing. And I realized that CTS was doing those, you know, these bucket list events. So I'm like, hey, guys, my name's Allie. Can I join your ride? You know, <laughs> and so Perfect. I meet Chris, Chris through that. And um, uh, I'm like, I need a coach. <laughs> he goes, yeah, you do, because you're crazy. And uh, so he said, I have just the person for you. So I worked with Dean Golich for many years. I uh, met Adam through that and Adam and I are quite kindred spirits and understand that as well. So I've transitioned to working with Adam on the last several years and it's been amazing to have that support. But there's something, I mean, that's applicable to the time period that we're in right now with the COVID-19 and a lot of people are sheltering in place that um, the structure has been amazing. Like I did go through a period where I didn't want any structure, a little burned out from road racing. And poor Adam's like, I gave you training. Are you going to do it? I'm like, no, instead I rode eight hours. And he's like, oh, right. gosh, you're not getting fast. And so to have structure, I think I highly recommend coaches for that. Um, I've used Training Peaks since 2008. Um, and so, yes, I have all my files from them. And But using a coach for that structure, it, it makes it your two-hour ride really efficient or 90 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever you have. And I think that really helps life balance. Yeah, Wow. That's awesome. Um, so now coming into the year, what were your goals? How have they changed? This is a big topic. Um, so if we go back in time to maybe December timeframe, what were you guys chatting about in terms of what does a 2020 successful season look like? I wrote my goals down on paper with a pen. And what'd that say? I just have to give you a little background. My, I'm kind of terrified to say it because I took a step back last year and I told Adam I didn't want any goals and I just wanted to ride my bike and do as good as I can and be able to have a glass of wine or two at night and have fun. And this year I thought, okay, no, I'm ready again. And he's like, cool, when you're ready to talk, call me. <laughs> and so this year I, I, my goal was to, is to, was to uh, win Dirty Kansas, um, have fun um, and look for the pivot points and, and learn to say no. So those were my goals. Nice. That's good, realistic. And I took a picture picture of them and I uh, texted it to you, Adam, didn't I? Yeah. Yes, you did. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, Adam, how'd you feel about those goals going into the season? Yeah, you know, it, I think with an athlete like Allison and somebody who has raced and performed at, at the top of her class and also been doing it as long as she has, I mean, you got to give the bandwidth to the athlete when they need it. Right. And so it was one of these things where making the transition from road to gravel. And then this time period where, uh, I think Allison just needed some space. Right. And I knew that the motivation was in there. I mean, she's still riding. I saw all the files coming through. She logs everything. She makes comments on training peaks. And so, I mean, literally without even talking for, I don't know how long, I knew exactly where she was the entire time, right? And then when she did uh, reach out, give me a call or text message, she's like, we're doing this. I'm like, all right, we're ready. And I knew right then and there. And I knew exactly what we needed to do. So, And what time frame was that? What month was that? When was that, Allison? I think it was around October, November. October, November. Okay, yeah, so you had a November, good, yeah. solid winter focus. Yeah, he didn't. 
I didn't want any training after a dirty Kanza last year. Um, I trained into it, but it was a really just rough mentally and emotional year for me. Um, you know, some of it's pretty private with my family, but it was just a hard time. And I just was struggling with balancing it and expectations. And so Adam, you know, he didn't push me further than I was able to. He gave me enough structure. And if I failed, that was okay, which is wonderful about him. And he also understands life balance, which is really important for athletes. Um, and it's funny, I, when I reached out to him, I said, I want to train with you. And he's like, okay, are you actually going to communicate? Are we going to do this again? And that's what's wonderful. I mean, he accepts me for, for who I am and understands what I need. But I said, yes, I'm, I'm ready, but give me six weeks to just like give myself some grace and get ready. And right. uh, so I did like my own prescription of intervals with him watching. Of course, I'm uploading everything and telling him what I'm doing. But I just, I'm like, I just need some time to like reset and see what I, where I'm at. And I was totally ready. And then we did game on and we're doing great. Yeah. 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 It's perfect. And she, you know, like I said, like when you have that, the background that Allie does, you know what you need to do to kind of get the threshold up there. She's a time trialer phenotype. So, you know, she goes and does her 20 minute efforts and hill climbs and all this kind of stuff. So then, you know, the FTP gets up and then we get to work, which is working on that next level, working on the VO2, working on some uh, anaerobic power, which, you know, with some of these gravel events, you don't necessarily need the anaerobic power or sprint to, to win. You need it to get that front group and you need to be more resilient. So the structure in place right now is nested within the overall plan. And that's what we're working on. Got it. Yep. So talk me through the last three months and we have the COVID crisis how, you know, Dirty Kanza is now, you know, obviously virtual, you know, what have those conversations been like between you, you two? We've discussed some ideas. We got, we definitely have some cool ideas in the pipeline, um, whether it's a record or a, just a superior challenge just for myself, though. I don't really want to put pressure on other people in this time to feel challenged. Honestly, I'm having a lot of fun training. And when I see some of these challenges, I just go, I, I called out and I go, I feel bad. I don't want to do them. I just, I like, I hate the, the VO twos, but I like doing them right now because I'm getting better at them. And like, I like to see the effects of training and I have never been home in the month of May. Like I have right. always been on the road at the tour of California to racing. I'm like, I'm home with, I haven't been sick since I don't know when. Yeah. So Adam is, is, is the training the same now? Uh, as if there were races, how have you been planning for, for Allison? Yeah. So the focus is the same because the end goal for me, for Allison and kind of the end goal with us, uh, working together on the same thing is performance. Right. And that's where I always start with, with an athlete, whether you're doing your first century or you're trying to win dirty Kanza, it's, I want performance out of my athletes. Now, how you do that is, is very different based on the athlete's past experience. With this unique uh, time period where we're in right now, we just have more time. We have more time to do the training. We have more time to recover between the training. And we have less variables going on from plane rides to all the other, you know, crap in life. So it's actually, it's a really, it's a fun time period to really focus on developing uh, Allison for who, for what she could potentially do. And this is probably the most like the most concentrated focused training block she's done since she came off uh, the world tour. And um, like she said, I mean, we're hitting some powers that we haven't seen in a while to me, the, the end goal, well, sure. Winning and have in seeing that performance come out. That's awesome. And then we move on, we get back to the process. And to me, that's the most exciting part. And we have the, the canvas to do it right now. So you're having more time to work on the specific abilities thoroughly. It sounds like. You can actually do what you intended to do in the training program instead of, oh, I have to travel Friday and Monday and I have this and that. You know, my hours aren't any longer. They're not any shorter, but they're very focused. And before your factory and travel days, product launches, I did all my product launches last week. We launched a new specialized diverge. Uh, I, I was on Zoom for probably 12 hours and I really do like the, well, I like monotony. I'm not going to lie. And I like structure. So I highly encourage that. And, and I know people are asking, like, how do you find motivation? But it, it is fun to watch. I mean, endurance sports are so unique that way. I mean, you can watch that direct relationship of, of very focused training and, you know, your performance increasing with appropriate rest and balance. So what does a typical week look like? Hmm. 
Well, right now, Adam hates me. So <laughs> very true. He's very making, true. He's How's making, that? You're not following the script? <laughs> no, no. I, tell, yeah, tell him what's on, what's queued up for the week. We're in kind of a high intensity um, phase. So we're doing some VO2 um, work because if I'm left to my own devices, I ride 30 hours a week and do a bunch of hill repeats at threshold because that's fun. Um, so Adam makes me do short efforts now that are really hard. And so I had, to, I'm having two VO two days yesterday. I did six by three minutes all out kind of, um, with no huge spikes in power, but sustained very high power and it doable. Um, but definitely well above F like your FTP today. I worked on some FRC. So 15, 20 second sprints, then followed by some like kind of sticky high tempo endurance riding, which feels a lot harder after doing 15 by 20 seconds. Oh, the last one I went virtual on, by the way, Adam, sorry, it was three and a half minutes. Say okay. <laughs> I sprinted and then I just kept going and then I died and I hit 192 heart rates. I apologize. <laughs> New max. Any recovery after those uh, 20 second sprints, it sounds like? Um, I did one 20 second sprint every four minutes, basically. So three minutes and 40 seconds of recovery until I yeah. did a lap. It was, it was on number 15 though, Adam, I went for the QOM and I got it. So okay. perfect. Love it. <laughs> and you mentioned, did, did you mention VO two efforts, like five, six minutes? I did, did six by three. And then tomorrow I do seven by two. And those are pretty short for me. I, I usually do three minute VO two. So he's just really working on that high, high end. Um, so these are just a hair higher. I think I did them about 10 watts higher than my three minute last week. And so we are, we have three weeks block of that. And then on the weekends I'm riding pretty long, like five and four hours or, or whatever, but okay. he gives me grace. He says, ride between two and four hours, see how you feel. But I mean, I kind of like just the a little venture and getting outside with my quarantine partner. Yeah. And I'll chime in there. Cause for those listeners, you know, hearing that, I mean, that's a pretty, that's like hmm, VO2 sprints than vo2 it's i wouldn't recommend that for just anybody and <laughs> uh, and i'll put the asterisks and star and caution last and you week haven't seen work out what it'll look like tomorrow so good luck to me <laughs> that's right because i said we, we have the canvas right now so we're we're doing some experimental stuff to see where where last week we did the same three and two but i had a day in between of just endurance work this week i wove it in because i i could see and hear and listen and saw the power she's taking care of herself. She's back to, you know, sleeping well, the recovery times in between. So I'm going to say, okay, let's weave in some of this anaerobic capability. I don't think that the VO2 power is going to be changed because again, it's steady. So the anaerobic the in between and having 12 hours should work out. I could be wrong. I don't know, but it's, it's well, going to make you for also really added another VO2. You add another VO2 as well. That's so true. there's that. Another Last week yeah. was like five and six, and this week are you know magically yeah. six and seven. I don't understand. It keeps adding on. <laughs> Progressive Progression. Overload. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Steady overload. For how many weeks of that overload? Three, uh, three. I think. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we're in week two right now. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, you know, he uses training peaks, Dirk, as well for um, right my rest days. At one at one point, he put profanity in there. Yeah, we don't talk I, about that. But. I wasn't. I wasn't resting because I still uploaded my ride. It said rest day. It would be like a two and a half, three hour ride. And then the next week he's like, look at training peaks. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm all good. And he's like, no, look at training peaks. And it, it had some very direct explicitives to how yeah, I should you, rest. You can report that <laughs> to our customer support team. <laughs> no, I, I loved it. I was like, you're funny, but I still like okay. <laughs> So I'm hearing a little bit about testing, pushing the limits in here. Tell us about that. Now that we don't have racing, was that the testing? And now you have a different type of testing? Or he doesn't make me do a lot of those tests. And I appreciate that and love him for it because it would really stress me out and I would lose sleep. Um, because I think the testing usually does come in races. You know, you can do your all time. Usually you do your all time highest 20 minute power in a race or an event versus what you can do in a controlled environment when you're stressed. But a couple of weeks ago, he had me do a max 90 second effort just to see. And I lost so much sleep over it. I was very stressed. Part of that was I, my fault. Oh, well. <laughs> I pulled a Jim Miller. Story? Yeah, I pulled a Jim Miller, actually. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So he put the, I don't know, the percentage of my FTP wrong in the calculations for what I could do for 90 seconds. Right. And it was, 
I think it was, what was it, 541 watts or something like that? For you, it turned out being 575 because I built it for like 250% of FTP, which just means max, right? So for I build that for a lot of athletes, I say max. For some people, I'll get prescriptive and then I'll just adjust that percentage and I put it in there and I said max. But yet she's looking at the number and she's like, I can't do that. And of course, without texting me or calling me, she's asking everybody around her, she's like, what... <laughs> What is this is possible? Thinking? Yeah, is this possible? And all, I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> I told my boyfriend, I was like, I have to do 575 watts for 90 seconds. And it was in a week and a half. And Dirk, I didn't reach out to Adam. Okay, note to everyone listening, communication is key. So right. I like literally, he like makes me coffee in the morning. I'm like, I can't do 575 in nine days. He's like, nope, you can't do that. And I go, okay, I can't. And then finally, I, I go, maybe Adam's just trying to teach me to fail because Adam is wonderful understanding I'm a perfectionist and an overachiever. And so I try to always prove him wrong. And, um, and so I thought maybe he's just teaching me like, cause he told me, he tells me it's okay to fail, which is wonderful advice when you're doing a workout. So, cause I get nervous. I'm like, I don't know if I can do that. And he goes, what do you say, Adam? You say something about it's okay to fail. It's not perfection. It's progress or some, some sort of like quote you give me. You say something like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I say go ahead. I mean, fail forward is kind of what I've told you before. Because fail forward, you you go, you explore, you you learn about yourself, you and you explore your edges. And I and I've talked about this on other podcasts. But when you push up to that edge and truly try to do something you've never done before, whether it is ninety seconds or twelve hours or whatever, that's when you really start to learn the good stuff. And you're going to fail along the way. You're going to hit brick walls and slide down. And, but sometimes you break through, right? I just yep. read, a, yep. I just okay. read about um, failing forward in the book, The Happiness Advantage. Yeah, great book. Which, I, book. which I'm reading right now. Um, and that was a great portion of the book, you know, failing forward. So yeah. absolutely love that. Like seeing your limits and learning from that. And, you know, you can fail but not be a failure, right? Yep, that's right. So finally, uh, it took me for so as far as testing Dirk, I I think he might be secretly testing me, but he knows that like since I'm a good test taker and you know valedictorian and 4.0 <laughs> student my entire life, if not 4.5, because somehow that happens, um, he doesn't test me as much as he pushes me in a healthy way that I don't get stressed. Um, and then when he gave me the correct number, I wanted to prove him wrong really bad, and I did by like one watt. So I'm pretty proud of that. Nice. <laughs> True. Yes. Yeah. But but yeah. By the time I did uh, make the course correction, because I was like, shoot, god darn it. And so I changed it to what about she could do on a good day, and yeah, she got within one watt, which, which again, you know, speaks to you know what she can do, and also <laughs> the power of communication, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So we've been talking a lot about all out efforts. How about the other side of it? Talk to me about working in rest. Um, are there rest weeks? Do you hate rest days? You know, um, Adam and I have a very good philosophy on that. And I, I guess I do trust you with that on Adam. I, I don't think he's ever told me I had a rest week because that would stress me out. So I think he just feathers and rides how I feel. Um, and I know enough throughout my career not to dig myself in a hole. And moral of the story, if I have a three hour endurance ride and I wake up and don't want to ride my bike, am I hung over? Am I just tired and jet lagged? Am I, you know, emotionally distraught from some personal situation? If I don't want to ride my bike, I don't ride my bike. And I know Adam will not like, he will not need an apology for that. He says for me, I mean, since I'm such a go getter and I ride a lot, um, that rest is really important. So if I want to rest, then yes, we listen to my body because I'm, I'm not lazy or trying to like hide from workouts. Um, so he does give me rest weeks. I notice, but I pretend to ignore that he gives me rest weeks, <laughs> but sometimes it's for freedom of mind too. just a bunch of endurance rides from, you know, he'll do like one to four hours, however you feel, you know, <laughs> just, and then I will go out and I'm like, oh man, I feel awful. He's right. And then I notice I do need a rest week. Yeah. Is there any threshold work during that, those weeks, Adam? No, no. And that's the thing, like, you know, we're sitting here talking and Allison, gives her perception about how it goes. And I sit here and listen and I, you know, I understand, but I think what a coach, what I do anyway, and what I think a lot of coaches do is you, you understand that it's not just about that training program and the, and the details and the specifics. You have to understand how the athlete perceives a training block, perceives intensity, perceives the test. Cause I, you know, I, I test her all the time, but yet I test her at no time. 
because you have to understand what the word test will do to her versus Joe Schmo versus Jane and Sally May or whatever. So it's how you communicate that, what you look for and how you develop the program. Meanwhile, when I know I've been pushing her a lot with intensity because of her training history and the way she kind of thinks and feels and also, again, takes care of herself. She sleeps well. She doesn't do all these extra curriculars and stuff. We have an understanding and a trust that, okay, an easy week means no intervals. And I'm going to advise you to bring the volume down, especially for a block. And because she doesn't have other things going, you know, she doesn't have family, she doesn't have kids, she doesn't have all these other things that factor into hey you know like a master's level racer they need a good five day block of like not doing too much right a couple rest days a couple easy days whereas her she she's a mover she's a very kinesimetic person and so to not have that in the program is actually kind of a a stressor in itself decrease the intensity for sure but keep her moving because that helps in the recovery process physically and cognitively so allison talks to me about routines do you have specific daily routines, weekly, in term, when, it, when it comes to recovery? Um, well, first of all, I, I actually love recovery days because that's when, I mean, maybe I, I actually, sounds bad, either I put on a flannel and ride around town and drop off mail, go to UPS store, you know, just cruise around for six miles, or it's super weird. I have a great uh, Wahoo setup um, indoors, and but I love doing recovery rides on the trainer because I can multitask and I do... Adam sees them. There's like, there is six TSS, 40 minutes, and I'm just spinning on Zwift at 50 watts, Mm -hmm. getting passed by a lot of people, giving me thumbs up though. So it's nice. Um, But I I like moving my legs just a little bit and I update my Instagram and stock on Instagram or something while doing it or take a conference call that I don't have to speak in. Um, So I do love, actually, I love rest days. I think they're wonderful. I can lay out, I can get stuff done around the house that it's amazing how much time riding bikes takes. Um, and then your whole day is full of a bunch of other things. So, um, my routine usually is to wake up between seven and seven thirty. I work until maybe about 11. Sometimes I text Adam to tell me to go ride. Um, cause I get antsy so I can tell once I can't focus anymore at the computer, I'm not riding, I'm not being efficient and I'm start pacing, bugging people. I go, okay. So it's go. time to go ride, kid up, kid <laughs> mm-hmm. up, go. And then it's wonderful. I'm back by two and then I am still working hours. I log back in. I work till whenever. Yeah. Routine for me is pretty simple. It's I ride, yeah, probably about between two and three hours every day and in between a time of work where I can still be really efficient. And as soon as my efficiency is gone, I go ride and I come back, eat and work again. So it's it's not, it's not bad. So, so what percentage of of your training is on gravel versus road or the different bikes? I'm going to admit, I mean, 90, what, Adam, 90% of my trainings on road. Um, I live in Petaluma, California, and I have amazing riding. And I live in downtown Petaluma. I have one stop sign, and I can ride for seven, eight hours on the most amazing Sonoma Coast roads. I mean, they're bumpy and you need to tubeless and 30 millimeter tires, but it's <laughs> very little traffic. I'm great training. I I know those roads like the back of my hands. I've trained on so many thousands of hours and I don't have actually gravel. Something that I would need a gravel bike, I don't really have in my backyard from my door. And I don't really prefer to drive to ride if possible. So I do most training on road, but I think that's pretty common. I mean, even mountain bikers, if they want to admit it, do most training on road. And road is predictable. The gradients are usually, you know, more steady so you can do very concentrated efforts um and i can move quickly and and, you know do 100 miles in five hours how about uh nutrition in these long races i know you're sponsored by goo Mm -hmm. what else do you like to eat what are your tips what's going on in your head to stay on top of this intense nutrition that you need to be taking in in dirty kanza yeah, so Dirty Kansas, of course, um, for those listening, is a very long event. Um, I think my record's 1140, so 11 hours and 40 minutes, so it's 206 miles. Um, and it can take people anywhere from, you know, the men's winners at 10, 11 something, or people spending 18 hours out there. Um, and for me, though, I have a, 
unique perspective to how I approach a race like Kansas, and I don't recommend it for everybody. But the one mantra I do recommend is eat early and often. Um, it is difficult at the start to eat and drink. Um, I wear a Camelback Chase vest, so I'm very stressed at the start. You're starting with how are thousands of your closest frenemies, <laughs> um, and it's mm-hmm. terrifying, and everyone thinks they're going to win Kanza. And so it's very fast and chaotic. So the hydration pack helps me at least drink. And it's also six in the morning when you start. And so I would, my goal usually is a bottle an hour. And I did that through my whole road career, which is a bottle an hour. And, you know, if, ideally, if it's hot and humid, you need more. But if, when it's cold, though, also, we tend not to eat or drink or it's early, you have coffee, your breakfast is still in there. So eat and drink early and often. And I um, aim for 250 calories an hour. And so I do put calories into my bottle because then I'm killing two birds with one stone. But usually those events do start at a much higher intensity. So I do the opposite what I did in road racing. So that's the interesting part, Dirk, is hmm. in road racing, you you know, the race starts, you got the first attack, you know, the break forms, blah, blah, blah. So you're eating bars, you're eating paninis, and then and then like an hour and a half to go, it hits the fan and you're like, gels, blocks, you know. But gravel is different because it starts out because everyone thinks they're world champion at the start and you're going to finish hours in front of people and just calm down. Like you're going so hard. So I do the high intensity fuel, which is just simple carbohydrates um, for the first five hours. So I act like I'm, I break cans up into two centuries and I do for the first five hours, the first century, I am doing a road race for five hours. And then I like say, you know, chow to the front group of men. And then I'm like, I need pizza, um, potato chips, a uh, donut, you know, what anything I want. Um, so then I kind of can switch to more complex, you know, with carbs, protein, and fat. Um, and I still do have goo electrolyte, of course, in my hydration pack and bottles. Um, and I can still take the gels, but I just also want to know what my stomach wants because sometimes your stomach can't handle all of that. But I do think it's eat early, um, eat and drink early and often, um, and then just forward progress, take care of yourself. So you just need to look and make sure you're having those bottles. Are you moving forward? And then in my feed zone or a checkpoint or whatever, I have everything under the sun. And it looks like I'm a 12 year old kid at summer camp with what I have there. Cause I don't know what my body's going to want at hour eight in 110 degree headwind in Emporia, Kansas. So I yeah. just have options and sometimes gels work great. And other times your stomach just starts feeling like too much sugar. So you're looking for salty. Um, and you know, it just, you kind of just go with what your, your gut literally <laughs> says eh, absolutely didn't ch- adam how about advice for a 50 year old like myself <laughs> uh well what allison said was pretty spot on i i like to think about it in terms of uh like calorie heat mapping sort of thing uh in terms of the intensity because when intensity is high you've got to do quicker absorbing foodstuffs when the intensity is lower that's when you want to put it in assuming you ha- you've got a good uh, stomach for it, meaning you can eat more complex things when the intensity is lower because you're you're utilize you're in the aerobic uh, energy state, right? You're not burning glycogen. You don't have all these other <laughs> weird things going on. So she's she's definitely right in um, in her approach with both road and in, in the gravel scene because he, if you listen to that what she was saying is she would eat more when the intensity was less and she would drink more consume more simple carbohydrate when the intensity was high and so i would definitely encourage that one thing that i like to work with uh some of my athletes to rather than like a calories per hour i like to look at a percentage of a per- percentage of output for intake meaning i look at calories burn and kilojoule if they're running a power meter and say it's uh, 500 an hour, I'll encourage them to, well, and we'll figure it out in training, but it could be anywhere between 25 and 35% uh, of whatever you burn for your intake, meaning that could span from 120 to 250 calories, like Allison said, sometimes even 300. Um, but you're looking at a, a percentage of intake per the output, and that's how I use data to make those nutritional decisions. And and work that into training. I mean, you have to That's right. practice that as well. Yeah, you don't want to figure that out on race day. You figure it out way before. All right. So, Adam, um, I heard you conduct one of your own podcasts. Hmm. Uh, by the way, yeah. what's the, why don't you go ahead and plug that now? Uh, sure. Uh, it is the Train Right Podcast, and our topics and guests 
and discussions are all about uh, things that further the endurance athlete's performance. Okay. And I saw you within one of those interviews, you, ha- you ended on a kumbaya moment, which we're going to have now. And the question you posed to your guests were, what do you each appreciate about each other? Um, I appreciate how she takes care of all the other stuff that my athletes don't, meaning like she's really good at recovery. She's really good at putting the, the files into training peaks, making the comments. If there's like two files, she'll delete them. If she notices there's a bad spike in data, she'll delete it. So I don't have to. And I know that when I pull up my WKO five pulls from training peaks, I know that everything coming through is going to be clean data and I can just absorb it, interpret it, and then start to develop my training strategy and and decide whether I need to talk to her that week or not. And it's just like very clean, concise, and simple. And I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. Well, perfect data geek. I am. Sure. I definitely am. Um, so my training peaks, I just never log in there because it's a, it's it's basically a diary. It's like a twelve year old's diary, like a twelve year old girl's diary. She's I'm like right. Adam. So this happened today, and then this happened, and so I felt like this might have been hungover. Probably shouldn't have had that last whiskey, but you know, I still did my effort. My heart rate's a little elevated due to that. <laughs> um, That's so, yeah. important stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. And then yeah, he'll write back I- like. Yeah. yeah. One time I told you, I said, yeah, we learned from wrestling that if that's what happened on Friday, you still got to come in on Saturday and do your practice. And then, so then you learn how to monitor yourself <laughs> on Friday. Yeah. Um, but I, I love, um, <clears throat> that Adam, um, understands and accepts me. And so it gives me a safe place to fail, to write my diary into training peaks. Um, also, lets me be an adult and independent and make my own choices. And he's never going to text me. Uh, you know, he said five hours and I wrote six and a half. He's just going to be like, well, the workout's going to stay the same tomorrow. So same thing, like drinking too much whiskey. He's gonna be like, well, you rode an hour and a half longer than I said, but then show up tomorrow and do those intervals. And he doesn't even say it though. He just doesn't change the intervals. So then I have this innate ability to like, want to, you know, prove him wrong that I can still do it, even though I feel awful. Um, and then also understanding when I need rest. So I think for him, he understands my personality We're we're very much alike in a lot of ways and very different, but we communicate well when we do, um, I have a ton of respect for him and that's how this happened. I mean, via CTS and friendship, but having a safe place to fail, to succeed. And so literally sometimes, I mean, I ride him. I'm like, how can I still like drink, ride and look good in photo shoots and do all these things. And can you just make, make a training plan for that for a second? And he's like, Oh goodness, you're a nightmare. But he never tells me I'm a nightmare. He goes, yeah, I got you. You know? And so I just, it's, it's a place to be vulnerable and, um, fail and he humanizes the sport for me. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Super. Well, I would, I would wish that for any athlete, you know, that safe space. So, uh, I appreciate it guys. That was, that was awesome. Allison, we were supposed to meet up at Steamboat Gravel. That's been put off for another year. Adam, we were probably going to meet up at Endurance Coaching Summit. That's virtual now. London, London. Yeah, we were. Yeah, yeah, yeah well. exactly. Um, so those times will come back. Um, but I love the focus, the energy. And uh, thank you guys so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having us. This is yeah. the most I've talked to Adam in a long time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I talked to him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Derek. This is awesome. <laughs>